Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today, our guest is Emil Schur. He is the founder of Catalyst Content, which is a, um, a digital marketing agency. He's also um, a host of the Seeking Profit podcast, and he's got a collection of three websites that he's building on the side. So he's got a lot going on, and he sees a lot of different things in the online world. We start by talking about his agency. It's only two years old. He started in 2021, and he shares um, his profitability numbers. He shares how he's built his agency up, and he shares the structure behind it. We talk not only about the way that he serves his clients, but we also get into the conversation about freelancing, working in-house uh, as an SEO, or uh, running your own agency. He has some very interesting things to share along that line. We spend the bulk of the second half of, of the interview talking about his websites. Um, he started three websites over the last couple of years, and each of them are in very different places. But his most successful site is one that he picked up off of someone. He uh, bought uh, an older site that was actually doing pretty well, but hadn't had any content published on it in a long time. And so we go through the story of how he kind of revitalized it, how he added a bunch of content to it, the way he went about building links, and um, in, in, I believe it's just over a year, the site's now earning six, $7,000 a month in, uh, in, in revenue. So he's done very well with that site. Um, all in all, it's, uh, it's really cool to hear the different things that Emil is going after. And uh, there's really something here for everyone. There's also something to learn from him and how he has his time spread and where he puts his energy because he's got a really good system in place for uh, the different things he's going after. I think you're gonna get a lot out of the interview today, enjoy. Introducing nichesites.com. Are you looking to scale your niche site portfolio or build your first website? Look no further than nichesites.com. With a portfolio of successful websites and over 700 plus satisfied clients, the folks at nichesites.com have the skills and experience to help you succeed. From keyword research to link building, content writing to done-for-you websites. NicheSites.com offers a full range of services to help your content site grow. As the saying goes, a trial is worth more than a thousand words and they're offering a special trial just for new customers. You get 5,000 words of content completely free with your order of 10,000 plus traffic backlinks. Don't miss this opportunity. Head on over to nichesites.com slash trial and take advantage of this amazing trial offer. Again, it's niche sites, plural, nichesites.com slash trial. Go claim your free content today. Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. In this video, I will show you how we landed a placement on BBC and dozens of links in massive regional online publications such as Wares Online, Daily Post and many more. This PR campaign was about the easiest place to pass your driving test for the first time in the UK. This is how we've done it. We simply went to DVLA website, found the latest car driving test data by test center and downloaded the data in a CSV format. Once we had the data, all we had to do is to look at the number of total tests per test center, then look at the number of first time passes to calculate the percentage of people who passed their test for the first time. Once we had the percentage numbers, we created a press release with our findings. Then we went to Roxhill and found journalists who talk about driving tests and also looked for journalists who write in regional publications in the UK. In total, we have found about 1,800 journalists and sent them our press release by email. Within less than a day, our story got picked up by BBC, Cornwall Live, Wells Online and dozens of other publications in the UK, providing our client a tsunami of backlinks perfectly relevant to the audience of the client who is a specialist in learner driver car insurance. I hope this video is helpful and it shows you how you can also build links with freely available data from official sources. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. All right, welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman, and today we have Emil Shore on. Emil, welcome. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having me on. 
Yeah, thanks so much for joining. It's um, as we were saying before we got started recording. I'm, I'm so used to having guests from all over the world, which is what makes this industry uh, this industry so fascinating and fun. That we our community is is based everywhere, uh, and is truly probably one of the one of the first global ones. But man, we're practically in each other's backyard. I mean, you're just up the up the freeway from me. <laughs> That's right, man. We're both uh, SoCal guys. It's weird. I usually say sunny Southern California, but we've had rain every single week for like months. And I'm, I'm scared that we're starting to pay too much for not awesome weather anymore. I tell everyone I would like a refund on my sunshine tax I paid this year because I did not get my value out of that one this year. For real. It's been a weird <laughs> uh, So let's see. You've got a lot going on. You're the founder of Catalyst Content, which is an agency. Um, uh, that, that does a lot of SEO work. You are the host of the Seeking Profit podcast, which is pretty new and really good, I might add. I've enjoyed several of the episodes I've listened to there. Uh, and then you're also a website builder on the side. <laughs> did, did I leave anything out or does that pretty much round out what, what, where you're at right now? That is everything. You make me sound cooler than I think I am by rattling all those things off. But yeah, I have uh, too many things on my plate is what it sounds like. Well, you're clearly doing a good job managing them and juggling them. Why don't um, you know? I ask everyone to kind of bring us up to speed on where things are at right now. I, I want to dive into your agency because you have a unique model, um, and I think a lot of people listening would get a lot of uh, out of hearing that. And then obviously we want to talk about your websites that you're growing, um, but maybe catch us up to a good launching point for today. Tell us about who you are and, and your background. Yes, yeah, so professional like marketing background. I've worked in marketing for like eight plus years. Worked at a couple different VC-backed startups, um, headed up demand generation for those, which is basically traffic and conversions is, is what that means. Um, you know, my strong suit was always SEO, and I always had other people on my team doing ads, email marketing, all these different other channels, but SEO was always like really my strong suit. And even when I was in-house, I was consulting on the side, and a couple years ago, decided to jump out and start my own agency. Like a lot of people probably listening, you know, I've always wanted to start a business, didn't know exactly what. And I was like, man, I have this, this marketable skill. I've seen a lot of, you know, I've hired a lot of agencies in house and a lot of them have a really low bar and they don't do a good job. And especially from an SEO perspective, like so many SEO agencies, like they just give the industry a bad name. And so I think working internally, I kind of got to see the gaps and see, you know, if I was doing this, how would I do it? How would I make it a better service for, for companies? And then, yeah, two years ago, I decided to just hop out on my own. And yeah, it's been a wild ride since. Starting a business is no small task. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've done it a couple of times and I joke about how you'd think it would get easier and maybe it does for some people, but it never did for me. Um, how, like, how did you um, navigate some of the challenges with starting a business off, like finding clients, getting systems in place, finding people to work with, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's funny, like your problems never get easier. They just become different problems through every stage. Uh, you know, like I think client acquisition is probably the hardest thing when, when you're first starting out. The other things, you know, I had a good playbook. I had a good operational mindset from doing it in-house and for some clients on the side. So the biggest thing was finding clients. And so when I was ready to, to jump out, I think like I gave myself a month or two to basically build up a small client base on the side. I reached out to current clients, friends I had, you know, luckily I'd been working in house and I had tried to network with a lot of other marketers for, for years. And so I had a nice little network and I just reached out to a bunch of people and just said, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm jumping out on my own. This is what I'm offering. Do you know anyone? And luckily, you know, I had a couple people refer me to others, got a nice little client base going and, and jumped out. Honestly, one of the things that helped me the most, and I kind of knew this when I was ready to leave the company I was at, I was the only person doing the thing I was doing at that company. And so it was very, very successful, like really good SEO program at a company called Roofstock. And so when I left, I had pitched the CMO on, hey, I'm starting an agency, but I'd love to continue supporting you guys. And I had a really mm -hmm. good relationship with my boss. And so like they became one of my early clients and that helped tremendously too. That is probably key because at least you walk out the door with a good relationship intact and you can kind of springboard off having a little bit of a client base at that point. Yeah. And I, yeah, I like knew the systems. I knew the company. I knew everything cause I had built the program. So, you know, for them, it felt like a really easy transition and 
it worked out really well for both of us. What, what kind of structure does your agency have right now? Are you guys, you know, a kind of a large scale team in house outsourced model? Like how do you guys go about organizing the team and then deploying um, the different deliverables? Yeah, so I have, um, you know, a lot of agencies will either hire full time or part time. I've kind of set it up where everyone I work with is contracted out. So writers, uh, I have an editor who is like the main person on my team who I like keep close and try to keep as not internal as possible, but she needs to be close and know all my customers and how we like to edit things and all that. So writers, editor, I have someone who does link building, but that's all outsourced. And the reason I like that is it, it always gives me the flexibility to go up and down with people as needed, right? So, you know, one of the hardest things about starting a business, you know, you get payroll going and you lose a client or two, like, man, you're, you're stressing about payroll and how am I going to pay everyone and pay myself? This kind of kept it flexible where, uh, we get more work. I get more people on board. We have less work, either less people or they just, you know, have less work. So, um, I also have liked that model a lot because it keeps it so I don't have to really scale the business for it to work. Like I can have five, six, seven clients and have it be a really good profitable business. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I, I tell people I work with is, you know, you get to work with me. A lot of times you come into an agency and they, they may kick you down to like someone who's fresh out of college, who doesn't really know what they're doing. And so they're kind of learning on your dime but I've been doing this for eight plus years and you get to work directly with me. I do all strategy. I do all like project management and stuff. So it's kind of this weird hybrid between like a consultant and an agency where we can deliver, but I'm also consulting and offering strategy. That's uh, great. I, I, I mean, one of the big drawbacks that I know businesses have working with agencies is that they don't always work with the same person throughout the process. And the person they maybe connected with on the way in is not the person who they talk with month over month which isn't the same person who's looking over their reports. And right. so there's this kind of disconnect, right? Exactly. Exactly. What are the, are there any drawbacks to that model? I mean, uh, you, you sold me on the upsides pretty well. <laughs> what, are, what, especially as uh, payrolls do for my agency tomorrow. What, what are the, what are the downsides? Are there any downsides of that model? Well, hopefully, hopefully you guys weren't affected by that whole SVB fiasco and uh, you know, weren't stressing out too hard, but no, uh, no, thank goodness. Good, good. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's tons of downside there. Um, you know, let's say we get a new client on board. Sometimes I have to go find a new writer. Like I think when you have in-house writers, you get to train them. They get to work across various clients. I, I've like, when I started, I took this approach where I was like, okay, I'm going to find a, uh, a writer who knows this industry. So we have an accounting, uh, software client, for example. Okay. I'm going to go find an accountant who does writing on the side, who, can actually speak to this audience. And so what you start to find is like, it's really hard to scale that when you start getting more and more clients. Uh, mm. I need to figure out a way to like have a couple writers who are just really good and can be trained on that client and that client's audience versus like, you know, this kind of weird model where I go and find a writer per client that I've done. Yeah, it sounds like the model gives you a lot of flexibility and then, you know, also has some inherent additional work sometimes maybe if I'm trying to overly summarize it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Onboarding becomes a little bit more challenging with this model. Um, you know, ramping everybody up versus when you have an in-house team, you know, you have a playbook. It's, I think much easier to onboard. It's less, probably less stressful for you to onboard a client than it is for me. <laughs> so you've done in-house, right? You yeah. worked at an agency. I believe you said an agency, um, prior to this, you're now no agency, just, uh, no inside of companies. Inside of companies. Yeah. So, but you've done SEO in house. Yes. I guess is probably the best way to put it. Yep. And then you now run an agency yourself. What are, like, what are the, the upsides of each? And I, I'm kind of thinking of the person that's listening right now that's thinking, you know, I work in house doing SEO. Should I do it uh, for, should I do it on my own as an agency? Um, you know, we just had uh, uh, Sean Hill on the podcast a, a month or two ago, and he's doing yeah. SEO full time. Uh, in house for a company. Um, and then the person who's thinking about maybe moving from in house to running their own agency, like what for someone who's been on both sides, what do you think the upsides and the downsides are to each? Yes. Yeah, so the upside is if you, if you get really good, um, and you feel like you can go out and sell you, 
your upside is just higher, right? There's only so much you can make as an SEO manager, uh, especially if you're like an individual contributor. Your ceiling for pay is capped. Then you usually go on to manager and then you have to manage people if you like that. So it's just there is a ladder that's kind of set for you and your earnings may be capped. But if you feel like you can sell and you feel like you can do this work really well, like you can just earn a lot more going out on your own. The cons, man, it's, you know this, it's, it's such an emotional game. Like three months ago, my pipeline completely dry all of a sudden, right? Like 2022, amazing year. I feel like I was turning down people left and right. And then the economy contracts, people are holding their marketing budgets tighter. And so it messes with your head, especially the first time you go through that like down period. You, just, you know, you start to question like, was this the right move? Am I really built for this? Did I just get lucky? So there's like, you're just playing this mental game with yourself all the time, um, which is any business owner, right? Agency or not, it's, it's like mastering an emotional game. I totally feel everything you're saying. It is, and, and again, having been doing business of some sort for a long time, it's just, it's, it's like you said, like it's just, it's kind of constant, you know? Um, within the last month, I've had an incredible week for business and a really, yeah. really hard week for business. And they both yeah. existed in the exact same month. <laughs> right, right. Same, same. It's been a couple good weeks. And then, you know, I'm, you send out a, a couple of, uh, what is it called? Proposals. And you're like, man, we're about to get going. And then people start ghosting you. And you're, it, it's constant, constant like ups and downs. And like you said, even in the same week. There certainly is a lot of value to being able to, you know, if you have the ability to work doing SEO uh, or marketing in general, by the way, the same things apply to, to marketing in general. Yeah. Um, but if you can do it for an in-house, you can learn a lot and also not have the risk associated with, you know, having your own agency or your own company where, you know, you're a little bit more results dependent for your income. So, yeah, I can see there being a lot of upside there. And um, there are times where I kind of wish I had taken that approach. So, so yeah, that's well shared. Um, let's see, where's, so where, where is your agency at right now? Any numbers you're comfortable sharing just so people can kind of understand what this model can, you know, where it kind of gets someone. Yeah. So last year, I don't think I've actually shared this anywhere, but I'm happy to share it here. Last year, uh, I think the agency profited around 250 K. Like I was saying, 2022 was a, a really good year. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I will match that this year, just given what's going on. And, you know, there's a lot of the, I work with a lot of tech companies that are laying people off their marketing budgets are harder. So it's just, it's a different game this year than it will be last year. So yeah, last year was a good year. That's great. Um, even a little bit of a downturn from that is still a great year. So congrats. And that's, that's on your second year in that's frankly, that's phenomenal. So I know well done. I, I feel like it was, like I said, a lucky year. I'm, I'm just hoping to like, you know, produce that consistently is the, is the big challenge, I think, for me. So uh, as we kind of alluded to at the outset, that's not the only thing you're doing. As a matter of fact, it's only one of many things that you're doing. I think um, I'm going to ask about the podcast on the, uh, on, at the end. I, I just okay. decided right now. Okay. I want to talk about your websites you're building on the side yeah. um, because obviously we, we talk to a lot of people here who are building websites as a side hustle or as a full-time gig, what got you into building websites? And I, was it like chicken or the egg here? You know, was it the agency was always the precursor and then because you got good at the agency, you started building websites or did the websites come first and the agency was something that came out of the fact that you knew how to build websites? Yeah, it was, uh, I started the agency. And so years ago I started investing in rental properties, not in California, because as you and I know, very cost prohibitive, it's hard to make money. So I was actually buying rental properties in like the Midwest, getting a property manager and just, uh, you know, owning them passively. Rental properties aren't passive, but, um, you know, I'd always you and I been do a whole podcast on that. <laughs> yeah, for real. So, you know, I'd always, I've always liked the idea of owning assets. The agency to me, the way I have it structured, it's not, I don't really view it as an asset. It's not sellable, right? Cause it's really me and contractors. So, you know, there's some agencies that are set up where it's an asset, it can be sold, but mine wasn't. So I was like, man, what am I doing? That's going to build up assets that are investments. And so I kind of, I think I ran into John Dykstra's blog, somehow fat stacks, like late one night on the couch and realizing 
like, oh my God, you can make how much from display ads now? Like I remember way back in the AdSense days where people were earning nothing, right? Like nothing. And I was like, man, this guy's making 80 K a month off of display ads. And so I just, I went down the rabbit hole. I think I bought his course and, uh, I just made the leap. I'm like, man, if I'm doing this for clients, I should be building my own stuff as well. Like I have the ability it's, it's different for client stuff. You need to get conversions. You need to get customers on, on the website side. You can really just monetize eyeballs. So it's like a different SEO game, but I've feel like I've been decent at both of those. Um, so I just started building up my own stuff. I wanted to like have my own assets that, you know, truly felt like assets bringing in income. Um, yeah. I'm just looking over our notes right here. You yeah. have three sites now. Yeah. Um, you know, and they're all at different phases and different journeys. Uh, let's, I mean, I want to spend the bulk of the time talking about kind of the bigger one, but it sounds like the first site you started, um, you know, did well out, has done well. I mean, and that's rare, by the way. I don't think many people, their first site kind of really goes anywhere. I think yeah. uh, for a lot of us, it's we make all the mistakes and maybe we forget to re register the domain or something happens and it just fades away into the distance. What was the process like getting going and, and getting that first site going? Yeah, luckily, you know, again, I've had, I have a background in SEO, so I think that gave me a leg up. I didn't have to like learn with the first site. It was more so learning how to monetize traffic in a different way and finding just low competition keywords that don't necessarily need uh, conversion intent behind them. Um, so yeah, I just started that site. I, I kind of gave myself a 5k budget. I was like, all right, 5k, I can easily invest that into a site and we'll see what happens. So I quickly built I think 40 articles to the site. Uh, I paid a VA in the Philippines who I've known for years, who helps me with link building, paid him to, you know, build links. I think we did like 20 links. And that was like my 5k budget, 40 articles, 20 links. And I just let it sit there. And I went after like really random terms that just had really low competition, had a bunch of other sites that had low domain ratings ranking for those keywords. Uh, let it sit for six, seven months. And all of a sudden, you know, it just rises out of the, out of nothing goes like 1000 page views a month. The next month it does six, the next month it does 16. The next it does like 30 without me really touching it. All of a sudden it just, it just woke up. So mm -hmm. I feel like part of it was luck. Part of it was, you know, I'm just choosing the right keywords. And again, knowing SEO and having a process and, you know, just using that budget and, and working the process. I'm guessing, did you follow the similar a similar approach that you take with your agency where you, you kind of outsourced all the work, but you headed up the strategy, you did the, the strategic parts and then had people writing, had people building links. Exactly. So find, find writers on Upwork who know about the topic, who can write about it well. Uh, and I'm just, I'm doing keyword research and creating briefs, which are just an outline of what I want the person to cover. Because, you know, again, as an SEO, I know how to look at top 10 results, figure out what needs to be covered, where are the gaps, what else can I do? What's a unique angle to help me rank in Google and just outsourcing all the actual work. So where's that site at now? You said about 40 articles, about 20 links. You let it sit, started getting page views. I mean, I, if I, if I paced myself correctly, you started that somewhere in 2021 and we're recording, Perfect. you know, beginning of 2023 ish, first quarter of 2023. So uh, what, what's going on with the site now? Yeah, you were right. I started in May of 2021. Okay. Uh, you know, now it's kind of on, on, uh, autopilot. Like I do a little bit of keyword research, send it to the writer. I have a VA who uploads it into WordPress. I just do a final review. It probably takes me like two hours. That thing made tw 1200 bucks last month between Amazon affiliate and ads. Probably 80% of that is, is ads 80, 90%. And then the rest of the, uh, revenue is Amazon and I'll probably do similar, maybe a little bit more this month. So not bad. Nice little site for not much work anymore. I mean, have you taken your eye off that? Like in terms of, it doesn't sound like you're putting a ton of content onto it anymore. It sounds like after you got that first initial batch live, you've sort of autopiloted or just done a little bit every month. Yeah. So I'm, I'm basically just doing, I have it four articles a month is my, is my goal mainly because that cost me like 200, 250. And, you know, I get to just pocket a thousand bucks. I don't think this site is like long-term going to be a killer. I just kind of, you know, thousand bucks, I'll cash flow a thousand bucks until either a Google 
update or maybe I'll sell it at some point if it kind of just maintains and grows slowly. I just, I know off of working internally, client sites, whatever, if you just let a site sit, it starts to decay. You just need to keep, you know, your eye on it, keep fresh content, update some old stuff if it really needs it or else they just decay. So, you know, you got to pay a little, play a little defense too. You kind of teased where I was going with that. Cause I wanted to ask, obviously you have other sites. And so at some point, again, I'm going to guess like late 2021, early 2022, you started to say, okay, this site isn't my priority. I'm going to put my priority towards another site or two. I'm always fascinated to hear why that is, right? Like why does somebody move on from a site? Yeah. You talked about the, the, the ceiling of this site, maybe not being as high, but are there other reasons? And, and again, how can people who are thinking of starting another site or wanting to move on, how do they decide when the right time is to split their focus or move on from one project to the next? Yeah, so this one, this one was kind of a unique situation. It was towards, it was like September, October of 2021. Site wasn't getting any traffic really. I was, I'd spent my 5K, I'm just letting it sit. A friend of mine who I used to work with uh, at a startup years ago, he had this site that he had started in like 2015, 2016, worked on it nights and weekends, it was an awesome site. He had 14 articles and this thing would average 30 to 60, maybe even 70,000 page views a month. You know, it's, it's a sports site, so it has some seasonality. And he hadn't touched it in years and it's kept either maintaining or growing. So to me, I just know I'm like, man, Google likes this site. He hasn't touched it in years and it's still like growing some. So I just, I knew this site had a ton of potential. It was, it was done really well. He created all 14 articles. They were, they were done really well. And I tried to buy it off my friend and he, he wanted, you know, he put so much time and energy and money into it that he kind of wanted this ridiculous valuation, even though it was, it was making like a hundred bucks a month off of you know, passive core sales. And I was like, man, I, I can't pay you like 30, 40 grand for this thing that makes a hundred bucks a month. <laughs> yeah. So we ended up, we ended up just doing like a partnership deal where he retained 20% equity, uh, and cash flow. So either monthly cash flow or when we sell it, you know, he gets a 20% stake and I took 80% without, uh, having to pay him anything. And man, that's, that's, so that's my main site. I spent, uh, would it be helpful to just talk about like what we what I did after acquiring it or please do yeah and the time frame helps a lot too because it's 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 great like you didn't you didn't actually say it but you had almost moved into this deal before your first site had really hit that growth trajectory right exactly um, but then this second site sounds like such an amazing opportunity and so it makes total sense that you want to jump on it yeah and it was also the niche I was certain to, I just I knew that niche or I felt that that niche had a very affluent audience and would just be more likely to like monetize better, right? Like advertisers, they knew who, if your site is getting, you know, like tech sites, that's why they earn so much is because, you know, tech people usually affluent or spend a lot of money, whatever. They, advertisers pay more, your affiliate deals are better, all that stuff. So I kind of just was like, I feel like this site has a lot of potential and I want to invest a lot of money in it. So uh, 2021, I end up, you know, having to lay the foundation, going and finding writers who know about this topic, training them, all this stuff. Fast forward to 2022, end up creating 300. We got it to like 50 articles by the end of 2021. And then 2022 was like heavy reinvestment year. I, we got to th 350 articles basically by the end of the year. So 300 articles in a year. So, and the numbers if we want to talk about like what it did in revenue. So we had 58 K in revenue for that site expenses came out to 34 K. So 24 K in profit on that site last year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that probably came on the backside of spending all that money on the content up front. Exactly. Like the first six months of the year, it's like, you know, 890, 1300, 2300, 3500, 4K. And then 5,700. And then you start July, 6,500, 6,900, 57, 58, 7,200, 8,100. So like you said, back half of the year, it's really just starting to pick up. Traffic hit like 150, 175 by the end of the year. So it just exploded after all that so it's, it's, it's There's so many different things I want to ask you about. Because in essence, you bought an age domain yep. that already had a substantial amount of traffic. 
And, um, you know, I, I, one of the problems with buying an age domain or working off of an age domain can be that it takes a little while for Google to kind of recrawl it and for um, your new content to kind of get picked up and figured out by Google. I'm, I'm using loose terms on purpose. But, yeah. you know, this site, it was, it's such a weird dichotomy. It was getting a ton of traffic, but it hadn't had an article published in a long time. Did you find that the content was kind of getting traction quickly? Uh, or was it a really, really, really long slog until you started seeing Google even, you know, really pick up a lot of the articles and give them um, and, get, and give them a lot of rankings? Yes. Yeah, so like, let's even, let's just pull some numbers. So by March of 2022, we had 90 articles. Uh, actually, let's look at February because then we can compare year over year. So February, we had 71 articles on the site. Uh, and page views were 40,000, where I think the previous February, 2021, before I had acquired the site, uh, I think it was like 30,000. So create a ton of content. It just, I think it's more so what you're talking about. It took a while. This year, 2023, February, we had 360 articles and then 172,000 page views. So oh, even geez. with a site that had traction, I think the fact that it hadn't had any new content in a while and I was starting to diversify into more affiliate best of type articles, like just different styles of articles. It still took a while for that engine to turn on where, I mean, you've seen it, right? Like there's a point where a site is seen so favor favorably that you publish an article and literally two weeks later, you're number five, number four, like you're just in Google's good graces and they really like mm -hmm. anything you publish and you're, you're moving fast. So what was the strategy? with the content when you came in um you talked about kind of how you targeted these kind of buyer terms maybe later on down the journey what was the approach when you you came into a site that had i think you said 14 articles so kind of almost i want to say like a brand new site but from yeah. a content perspective you certainly hadn't saturated the uh the niche yet the topic <laughs> yeah yeah what's funny is those 14 were actually <clears throat> pretty competitive terms they just have so much search volume and so many long tails that uh, it still did insane, you know, on a traffic per article. What I started doing was going for more long tail stuff and mm -hmm. different clusters. Whereas all, the, the 14 were just random topics that covered a, a good breadth of topics within the niche. I was like, all right, you know, it, there's like a little cluster here of keywords yeah. that have low competition. Let's write five or 10 of those, see how they perform. Let's try another five or 10 in this different cluster on this topic. And so you start to see is after six months, nine months, whatever it is, Google loves you for that topic. What like some topics you may not have hit other ones. They just, they think you're authoritative enough and they rank all those variations of, of, uh, clusters within that, you know, topic. So that was kind of, that's usually my approach is let's hit a different couple of different clusters that seem to have uh, the keyword, you know, keyword difficulty, I don't care as much. I want to more so see sites that don't have a ton of authority ranking for them. Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. This is how we landed massive links for our client in The Sun, a DR90 website, and many other UK news websites. We have used freely available data from YouGov to simply find out what the nation's favorite car brand is and which brands people love the most. Of course, Rolls-Royce came out on top, Aston Martin second and Jaguar third. We put these insights in a short email and sent it to journalists that write about cars and to national news desks on behalf of our client. Within a few days, our client got featured in all the suns as well as many regional newspaper sites in the UK, gaining DR90 links to their leasing comparison website. YouGov website is full of unlimited PR stories with data already available for free. All you have to do is to start researching their data and start asking the data questions. You will be surprised of the unlimited PR campaigns that you will find there that can help you build massive exposure and links to your or your client's websites. I hope this video is helpful and inspirational. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. 
I've asked this question many times before. Um, you're alluding to which direction you went, but I kind of want to hear you flush it out a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about going after low competition keywords. You, you talked about that a lot with your first website. You, you mentioned it here. You've also talked about kind of topical silos, really going after clusters rather than just going after perhaps the lowest competition keywords in your niche. You mm -hmm. know, because a website, you know, when you start doing keyword research for a website, you can look at the broad niche as a whole and find right. a lot of really low competition keywords. And they're all related to the, the broader niche, but they might not all be in the exact same cluster. Or you can go, nope, I'm not going to worry as much about how easy each keyword is. I'm going to zero in on this cluster. And I'm going to write everything about this cluster first before I move on to something else. Do you have opinions about which approach to go with? Did you go after a specific one there? Did you sprinkle both in? I think it was more of a hybrid. So I would look at a cluster and sometimes half of the keywords in it were hard to rank for because they had the higher volume and you know the bigger sites are picking them up and they don't go after the stuff that's like 300 searches a month. So I, would, I wouldn't cover the whole cluster. I would choose the easiest to rank within it, like the five mm -hmm. easiest, see how mm -hmm. I did there. And then if I have good authority, Google's ranking me for those, I'm going to go back to it later and cover the rest of them. Yep, smart. So you kind of lay down a footprint in each of the clusters and then sit back and kind of watch which one Google gives you the most love for and then zero in on that one. Exactly. And then, mm -hmm. you know, over time, it I think it changes. It's like you have a couple writers on board. You start to see what they're naturally good at writing and you start to feed them topics within that. Uh, you know, them being experienced in that that niche, that topic, you can ask them what products they use and you can just have them start knocking out reviews for those. Um, so yeah, it kind of evolves, but early on it's, it's fine clusters and then choose the easiest one within it to kind of test to see if you can build up authority in that or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's catch up to where that site is today. Like maybe anything you're comfortable sharing in terms of page views or, um, uh, revenue or, uh, yeah, well, you know, you know, all the numbers that, that people like to hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I did, I figured you would ask me that. So I did a little bit of math looking at the last six months. Our average revenue is about 30, uh, 6,700 and, uh, again, seasonal and we're out of season and we're moving into the season. So that number should be good. I'm hoping for as long as, you know, knock on wood, no major Google update, which, you know, let's, let's be real. We're going to turn this off and probably have a Google update this afternoon. Uh, Actually, should... one launched this morning, but who's keeping track? Oh, did track? it? Oh, yeah. of course it did. Uh, my, my goal, or just looking at year over year, I think we can get to 10K plus pretty soon here. So, and that mm -hmm. was on, so that last month we did 6,700 in revenue on 172,000 page views. Okay. How are those um, split in terms of the page views or just the articles in general? Or is it um, is it a lot of affiliate targeted pages, you know, like reviews, buying guides? Um, are you monetizing with uh, ads on informational posts? Yeah, so I have uh, right now two thirds, so 67% of the revenue is coming in from ads. So we use AdThrive. The other one third, 23% or 33% is coming from affiliate either. It's mostly Amazon. We just picked up one direct affiliate because, uh, they really liked us and gave us good terms. And so I was like, all right, let's try them out. See how that goes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we actually, so I do, I still put ads on my affiliate articles cause mm -hmm. a lot of people don't convert on those. I actually just, so I worked with, with ad thrive to create a a different layout structure for affiliate ads. So like I, a lot of times you see ads show up within the text of like talking about a product within a list and it's kind of, it's not the greatest experience. And so what I had them do is like we created a, a header type or header class. And when that's in there, they only put ads above like H twos or certain H threes, So that it's just a little bit cleaner. It has less ads and hopefully we just get more conversions on the actual products. And then on info content, you know, it's, it's much more ad dense, I would say. Yep. Yep. Um, that's great, man. So that, I mean, I'm just doing a little backwards, you know, back of the napkin math. I mean, you've built a site that's probably worth, I don't know, somewhere in the $250,000 range in just over a year. Um, congratulations. That's wonderful. Thanks, man. Yeah. It's, uh, 
it's nice to have a head start and I'm, I'm happy to talk about like, should you start a fresh site? Should you pick up, you know, clearly I, I probably have a bias now after going through this site and starting one from scratch, but, um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah one that's well. probably worth 35, 40, 50,000. And <laughs> yeah. you know, I think I know what you're going to say on this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, part of it is again, lucky, uh, I think it's hard to find a good aged site, but when you do, you know, the, as you can see here, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, it's so funny you mentioned that because um, I've just been talking recently about um, a website that we've grown quite a bit uh, on my side, and it started with somewhat of a similar story. I mean, they're not all the same, but it was a, a very an older website that you know, so it was an aged domain, but it had a lot of content, and it actually was a bit of an authority in its space rather than just being a a drop domain that you pick up because the backlink profile is good and you're kind of trying to repurpose. So there's probably something to that in your story. I know, uh, you know, I've worked with some age domains before and this is the most successful one I've had. And it really did have a true authority in Google's eyes about some of the topics that were still live on that page. Yeah, I would be, I think at this point, very hesitant to like go to Otis or something else and just pick up or from an auction and pick up like an age domain that really hasn't been active. It just, whatever, it got some links back in the day, but you really have to play this revival game and hope you're in Google's good graces versus this was a site yet yeah, hadn't been touched in a while, but it was still there. It had good content and it was getting traffic. Like it was very clear to me that, uh, Google liked it. Just the owner, you know, was focusing on different things and neglecting it. And so like, I think it's, it's the needle in the haystack. And that's the ultimate thing to find is, can you find a site that someone's been, was working on, they put a lot of a love and attention to, but just don't have time anymore. And you can scoop it up. It, it, I mean, in essence, this site sort of fell in your lap and I, I don't, I'm being very broad stroke by saying that obviously yeah. it's your network of connections, your experience in this industry that allowed you to kind of be available when it, the conversation needed to happen. But um, you know, I'm trying to think about the person that says, yeah, that's the kind of site I would like to get started on. Um, what are some things that people can look for, especially not necessarily being able to see the backend analytics or the traffic on these sites that, um, that you had the luxury of seeing here? Like, what are some things people could look for if they wanted to go down the route you went down with this site? Uh, that's a good question. I do feel like I got really lucky. Um, I knew someone who, you know, just happened to fall on my lap. It worked out for him too, right? He's basically doing nothing. And now he owns 20% of a, the cash flow on the site. And then if it sells, um, you know, I've heard a lot of people either being active in Facebook groups or different communities. Uh, people post stuff like this, like, Hey, I have this site that I'm looking to sell. I've been working on the side. I just don't have time. I think for the most part, you find, uh, these really good deals and, sites that people have been working on and love in these, you know, dark communities. I know people find them on marketplaces too. I think it's just, you know, they're public. You're going up against people who really know what they're doing. They know how to yeah. bid on it. They, they know the value of it maybe more so than I would have at the time. So I think getting in communities, talking to people, seeing if any, you know, even just asking, Hey, is anyone interested in selling a site that they've been working on the site for whatever, you know, I know other people who've, who've kind of done the same thing. Maybe they've built up their Twitter network and then they post, I'm looking to acquire a site. You know, they maybe post the three things they're looking for in a site. You know, um, Ryan Durrani, I think you, you know, him off Twitter as well. He, mm -hmm. he picked up a site from, uh, I think in the gaming niche and he picked it off, off, off somebody who actually came with the acquisition and now they're writing for the site. So it's like, you get the best of both worlds. You got the person who like was giving it all the love and attention. You get to pay them for writing versus maybe they had a hard time monetizing it and you're the SEO and you know how to grow it. The aqua hire. That's yeah. the best. Yeah, exactly. I want one of those next, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you're, you're getting my mouth, uh, my mouth's watering at the, the thought <laughs> and the possibilities of these kind of things. Cause you're right. I mean, starting a, a fresh site on a fresh domain is, um, there's, there's a, there's a ramp up. There's a time frame that you have to be patient yeah. with it. And then yeah, buying an age domain that you kind of like what you talked about one where you have to revitalize it. Uh, there's, there's a gamble there and then there's a waiting game there. And so, you know, uh, certainly there's some drawbacks if you buy a site and the content isn't awesome, but you, you really kind of hit a home run with this one. You got a site that Google loved content was good. 
and it had just been uh, ignored and under monetized. So you're able to get a really good deal on it and then just pour gasoline on a, on a fire that was ready to start. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of luck, like obviously I'm not going to discount a lot of the work that went into it, nights, weekends, whatever, working on the side, you know, agency is my main thing. This is like the side hustle for now. Uh, but yes, I feel like I got super lucky in just finding the right thing where, you know, I saw it had a lot of opportunity and I knew the person who owned it. So it just made it a lot easier. So let me ask you a couple more questions about some of the, the details, if I could. I mean, yeah. we've really gone into it on the content side. And um, yeah, uh, it's so funny because it makes sense on paper when you look back on it. It's like, oh, yeah, got this site and, you know, poured 300 articles into it and now making a bunch of money. But the mental <laughs> side of putting that many articles on a site and having it not really go anywhere yet is yeah. like there's a I'd like to have a moment of silence for probably the mental anguish you were going through doing that. <laughs> yeah, but, but um Luckily, honestly, it started earning, it was like three to four months of me pouring a lot of money in without it doing anything. And then by month four or five, it was at least breaking even to cover my content costs. So I, sh I should mention that. Well, that's good. That, 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 that quells a little bit of the emotional, um, you know, like expenditure that you probably had to make. Right. Um, you know, what about, um, what about the link side of things? We didn't talk about if this site had a lot of links coming into it. Sometimes these older websites have picked up a lot of links. And so the link building side of growth isn't as, um, as big of a deal yeah. at other times. Maybe, you know, you really get a site that doesn't have any links and, and that might be something you need to turn to. What have you done for link building for this site? Yeah. So early on when I got it, um, had a couple hundred, I think the DR was like a 20, 20 something. Um, I started using my VA in the Philippines to build links. You know, they're like niche edit, not amazing quality, but they're links. We make sure, you know, we have a couple of guardrails in place to make sure that these sites, uh, have some organic traffic going to them. So, you know, Google hasn't, you know, this as well as I know, it's very easy to, to, to game HRFs to have a 60, 70 DR on a site that literally gets no traffic. So mm -hmm. we have some more guardrails to, to make sure that doesn't that the site actually gets some traffic. Uh, but most of my money went into content in the beginning. And then mm -hmm. actually midway through last year, I'm thinking like, okay, what moat can I try to build here? Like I am mostly relying on Google traffic. Like that's the game I play. I know a lot of niche site people are talking about diversification, email, social channels. I'm like, I kind of go the other way. I'm not going to diversify yet because this is the one thing I know the best. I'll go mm -hmm. up with the ship, I'll go down with it. But like for me going in five, you know, newsletter, social, all these things spreads me thin and I don't really, I'm not gonna be good at five things. I can try to just be really good at one. So what's my SEO mode? I'm like, you know, I know the game, content and links. Hadn't really built awesome, awesome links yet. So I think it was like July or August of last year, I spent 5,000 bucks on a digital PR campaign, which is basically, you know, you have a, I have this agency I work with for some clients and I had them basically do it for this site. You create an article data backed, you know, kind of clickbaity, but has really good content stats, all this like original research. Um, and they go out and syndicate it to a network of like local news sites and then bigger publications see those and pick it up. And they all, the agency also goes and like pitches these publications on covering the story. And so I think we scooped up, I don't know, a couple hundred syndicated links, which syndicated links, uh, there's debate on if that does anything, but we got like, I don't know, 40 or 50 original pickups. Uh, I think it was like around 10 ish, 70 plus DR. I forget some of the sites was like biz journals, SF gate, some of these like big sites that have good authority mm -hmm. linking to this thing on our site. So, you know, link building is huge. I don't think enough niche site builder, everyone's like, Oh, I'd rather pour $5,000 in the content. I'm saying, look, man, I have seen this game work out. The people who have the, the strongest site, the best links, they usually weather the most storms over the long term. So long term. So I'm investing in some link building as well. That is, um, probably a little bit of a different approach than a lot of, uh, you know, niche website builders certainly yeah. would go about. And it seems like it's something that you prioritize pretty early. I mean, you were building some other kind of individual links, right? But 
you went after this approach and you're almost building a moat while you're still building the castle. If I could borrow the analogy, <laughs> right. Um, you know, you're still getting a lot of traffic. Uh, uh, you're still, sorry, building a lot of content to get that traffic while also building this moat. Um, is that something like, what else can we learn from that? I mean, I, a lot of people might say, mm, I'll wait to do that until I've got all the traffic and I've got all the revenue. You went a different direction. Like, what can we learn from that? Yeah. So as an agency owner, I get to work with different sites and you probably see it too. Niche sites get smacked way harder in updates than brand sites. And why do I, if I had to go through the emotional turmoil and the tumultuous turmoil of an update, on the client side, like you have to on the niche website side, I don't think I'd ha- I don't think I'd be alive anymore, right? Like they're just so much more stable on the client side. Same, yeah, exactly. And it's, I agree. If I saw a client side lose fifty percent, oh my, my, my ego would be destroyed. Like I know the game I'm playing with my sites, but client sites, it's a different feeling. Um, totally. So I try to look at like why why does that happen? And you know, it's like what everyone says: they're building a brand, okay? But in search, like what does that mean for search? They get a lot of good quality links. They get a lot of publications talking about them. There's like real domains, real quality domains, linking to them, talking about them, whatever. They're getting people searching for their brand name, things like that. So what I'm trying to do, while I'm not investing in like the whole brand side of newsletter and all this stuff, I do know that good quality links are never a bad thing to invest in. And so I see it on the brand on the client side, and so I'm trying to apply that to you know, the big money making niche sites that I own. I probably wouldn't do that for the first site I started just yet because it doesn't quite earn enough. And I don't think the potential is there, Mm -hmm. but for this one that was earning, you know, at the time I did that $5,000 campaign, it was, it was earning, it was earning good. It was like five, 6,000 bucks a month. It was like a a single month investment at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That month was negative because we invested $3,200 in writing as well, but you know, you average it out over the year and it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love what you said there. It's such a good way to frame it. I mean, um, you know, one of our clients, I have to email them every week and say, hey, I, I see you're on two more podcasts. Can you ask them to um, include a backlink? Yeah. You know, like they're natively building their brand and the backlink strategy is secondary. We're, we're trying to keep up with the other brand components. Whereas I feel like you're right. A lot of niche websites owners would be like, hmm. I'm only going on that podcast if I can get a link out of it. That's really the only value that podcast has for me. You know, it almost flips it on its head a bit. I love the way you positioned it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I've gone through that too, man. I feel you. So, um, I, you have a third site somewhere in here. Um, you know, uh, where did you have time to start a third site? Tell us a little bit about it. We're running a little low on time. So, um, hopefully you haven't, you know, generated, another $20,000 a month from this site. And we have another hour ahead of us. Like <laughs> I'm being facetious, but you do have a third site. Where, where did you start this and, and kind of, you know, where's that one at? Yeah. So this one, I started October of last year. <clears throat> I think the only reason I started it was because at the beginning of 2020, I wrote a goal of start or buy a new site. And I was like, I just wanted to check it off. And from the first two sites, I feel like I learned some stuff and I was like, all right, let's try to diversify with a third site. It's uh, in the parenting niche, which, you know, a lot of people have mentioned on Twitter, they're like, I would not touch parenting or mommy blogs with a 10 foot pole. Like I get why, because mommy bloggers, there's a term for mommy bloggers. No one else. It's not like any other type of blogger really has a name. I mean, maybe recipe bloggers, but uh, my bet, and we'll see how this plays out. I may be a fool. I may be not a fool. My bet is a lot of mommy bloggers are creating sites based on like passion and interest. Whereas again, mm-hmm. I'm taking an SEO driven approach, seeing if I can find, you know, the same, same way I've built these other sites. Can I find these little nooks and crannies where, uh, I can compete and outsource content to good, uh, people who know this industry, who know mom, like we have one writer who is Montessori educated and she has like a master's in Montessori education. So like clearly knows what she's talking about. The other one, she's mom of three, just a great writer. And so I'm just taking a gamble. I'm, uh, same process. I put like five, six K in that we've built like, I went a little harder on this one. I went like 50, 60 articles and doing some, you know, 20 backlinks and seeing what we get. So that one is in the, the seed marination phase and we'll see what, what happens with that one. 
Uh, Spencer owned a mommy blog for a couple of years. Um, oh, really? And it was fun following along on that. I think he sold it. I, he did sell it, I think. I think. Do you he know what? Keep up more. Did he do well or was it like he just ran up against, it was just too hard to rank in, in that space? Well, given that we're live and recording and I'm not 100% sure, I don't want to say. I think okay. he did all right. I think he sold that one around the time that he sold his um, niche site, Project 4 site. Okay. But again, I think it was around that time. So um, and I remember, I do remember him sharing about a lot of the challenges he had at that industry, right? Because it's so yeah. different and unlike any other industry. And, and when yeah. you said that, that's what sparked my memory of, of what Spencer had when he was up against with his. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I'm just going to let the site sit, see what it does for the next couple months. If it starts to do the same thing with the first site, I'll go back and start reinvesting, you know, get some ads up on it, reinvest revenue into creating more content. If it doesn't really go anywhere, I don't know, maybe I'll sell it as a starter site and, and, uh, go buy a site. Like we've talked about someone who just has a good site that's been ignored for a while. Right. Right. So, I mean, 2023 and beyond, I mean, uh, what are the, what are the plans? Like circling back full circle here, you know, big picture. That was the word I was looking for big picture. Like you got an agency doing very well, maybe expecting a little bit of a downturn in 2023, mainly just because of where the global economy might be. You've got these websites that are kicking off and doing really well going into the year. I mean, are you going to continue to invest in these three sell a site, um, expand more in the agency and go harder there? I, I'm just so curious. You have, you have a lot of, a lot of different options on the table to pursue. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm trying not to use like a marker to say, this is where we're headed. I'm kind of, it's nice. I've made a couple bets. The agency I think will always be there. The nice thing about these sites is, you know, earlier this year, business was slow. I got to put more energy behind the content sites. And so when, when agency client stuff picks up, I focus a little less on client sites or on, on my personal site. So I like the balance of having them both. I think the main site still has a ton of potential this year will be the year of we created so much content and i feel like we've improved the structure and the way we do things you know over time you develop like new templates for your affiliate articles or different articles so right now i'm actually in the process of not creating a ton of new content but going back and improving a lot of the affiliate uh affiliate focused content so this will be the year of slow growth in terms of new content. I don't just want to do another 300 articles, but really like optimize everything we have, improve mm -hmm. it, make sure it's up to standard and that we're monetizing what we have as well as we can. And then we'll, we'll see. I don't know. We'll see where that takes us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't get a chance to ask you about some of the, some of the more nuances, right? Like updating content and, um, you know, EAT or, you know, these kind of nuanced things that are important, but you know, obviously they, there's a time and a place for them. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, amidst all this, you decided to start a podcast as well, <laughs> <laughs> which I've got a couple episodes. It's great. It's with, um, it's, it's with a former, uh, guest we've had on before here as well, which was a great podcast episode. Um, you know, what are you guys, what are you guys talking about on that podcast? What are the focuses? Yeah, so Andrew Fiebert, who's uh, my co-host on Seeking Profit, he owns uh, Lasso, which is a tool for affiliate marketers. He approached me like a couple, four months ago, and he's like, hey, what do you think about starting a podcast? I really wanted to, and uh, you know, things were a little slow towards the end of the year. I'm like, okay, sure, why not? Why not add another thing to my plate? Uh, you know, we, the, the things we're trying to do with this one is really go internal on our business and as we test things and try things, we're just sharing that with the audience, internal operations, how we do certain things, how we find writers, how we create content briefs, what we look for in sites. So just diving deep into our own businesses. And then Andrew gets to see a lot of big sites through his clients at customers at Lasso. So, you know, without mentioning them, we get to like pick out what they're doing and, and share that with the audience. So, um, you know, another great resource. I, I love your podcast. I listen to it every week, you know, awesome guests and you get to kind of see what different people are doing and ours is, uh, you know, doing something. We're just more introspective on like what's going on in our businesses and stuff like that. Yeah. It's super in depth. Yeah. The couple I listened to were really in depth. I love, I love that. Um, Thanks man. Well, we'll include a note. Uh, we'll include a, a link, sorry, in the show notes 
for the podcast as well. And um, you're pretty active on Twitter. Uh, that's where you and I kind of have gotten connected. What's your handle on Twitter? Yeah, I'm uh, at Emil Shore, which no one can probably figure out how to spell. So that's uh, E-M-I-L-S-H-O-U-R. Perfect. Okay. We'll get all that in the show notes. I, um, it's, uh, this was fun. You have a lot going on. <laughs> you have a lot going on. I love it. Um, we probably, going back to your analogy, we probably uh, definitely covered the breadth of the topics, but I feel like we could have gone in depth on any of them any of the four or five things you have going on, we probably could have gone in depth on each of those for an hour each, but, um, but maybe we'll do a part two down the yeah. road. So thanks. Uh, thanks for coming on board. Hey, I'm excited to see what 2023 and beyond looks like. You have a lot of different, you know, different plates spinning and you, but you clearly have a good handle and a good grasp on which ones um, are the priorities at different times. So congrats on your success and your growth in the last year or two and um, long may it continue. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm following in your footsteps. You're doing the same thing. You've got the agency, you've got this podcast, and you've got your own site. So, you know, we're, we're both juggling similar things here. The similarities are strikingly um, Uncanny. Uh, obvious in many yeah. ways, which I only sort of knew and uh, I half knew before we got in the podcast. But yeah, no, you and I, and, and we're just, you know, 90 miles away from each other. So, that's... yeah. Yeah, my brother-in-laws live in San Diego, so I, you know, go there, down there with my family once or twice a year. So let's meet up, let's hang out. You got it. Yeah, like I started the podcast with, man. Everyone is all over the world, and it's so awesome. But I don't see enough people in person in this Same. industry, so that would be great. Same. Well, well, until that happens, Emil, <laughs> it's been uh, it's been great talking, and uh, we'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks, Jared. Introducing NicheSites.com. Are you looking to scale your niche site portfolio or build your first website? Look no further than nichesites.com. With a portfolio of successful websites and over 700 plus satisfied clients, the folks at nichesites.com have the skills and experience to help you succeed. From keyword research to link building, content writing to done for you websites, nichesites.com offers a full range of services to help your content site grow. As the saying goes, a trial is worth more than a thousand words, and they're offering a special trial just for new customers. You get 5,000 words of content completely free with your order of 10,000 plus traffic backlinks. Don't miss this opportunity. Head on over to nichesites.com slash trial and take advantage of this amazing trial offer. Again, it's niche sites, plural, nichesites.com slash trial. Go claim your free content today. Today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. We got tiny links and placements on massive websites such as The Express, Mirror, Daily Record, and many more with a campaign about the pros and cons of popular diets. Mm, not bad. This is exactly how we've done it. Our client is a very popular fitness client. We have asked them to provide thorough expert commentary about the pros and cons of the most popular diets. Once we have this information, we put this in a nice email and send it out to 15,000, yes, 15,000 journalists from around the world that write about fitness. So good and unhealthy. Big publications picked up our story from the email, giving our client massive, juicy, saucy, healthy links that are 100% relevant to their website and that will keep the rankings of the website in a great shape. You see what I've done there? I hope this case study inspires and that you will start leveraging expert commentary type campaigns to land links to your or your client's website, just like we've done it with this campaign. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now.